CPR program uh, is rapidly advancing and leading to the first human clinical trials. We've shown efficacy across a number of animal models. We're in the process of manufacturing now to plan for NIND enabling studies and ultimately phase one clinical trials in optic neuropathies. Um, we've demonstrated efficacy in a number in optic neuropathies involving retinal ganglion cell dysfunction. That intravitreal injection of OSK or ER100 improves visual function and axon health in a non-human primate model of nine, building on the efficacy that we saw in the mouse models of visual aging and glaucoma, um, as well as there's no adverse safety findings in mice following 15 months of systemic delivery or 21 months of intravitreal delivery. Today I'm going to talk to you about epigenetic reprogramming. Uh, epigenetics refers to the study of how your behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect how your genes work. So we can think about drinking, smoking, um, exercise or lack thereof, all of which ha can cause epigenetic, epigenetic changes. Unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are reversible and don't actually change your DNA sequence, but rather how your body reads a DNA sequence. One form of epigenetic change is DNA methylation, and you can see increase or hypermethylation in both aging and injury. Um, as you can see, you know, we've all been talking about these, you know, chronological age and methylated DNA age correlation plots um, all the last few days. Epigenetic reprogramming refers to the erasure and remodeling of epigenetic marks, such as removal of this DNA hypermethylation. So life sciences approach is to focus on partial epigenetic reprogramming. So as we all know, Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize for a work he did on complete reprogramming, where he identified four specific factors, transcription factors, OC4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYK, all of which when combined together can take mature cells and take them all the way back to pluripotent stem cells. Um, while successful, in vitro to do all of that, it also has been shown that in vivo, you may cause some teratomas. So what Life Biosciences has been focusing on is partial epigenetic reprogramming, where we're using expression of three Yamanaka factors, OS and K, OC4, SOX2, KLF4. Um, we've removed CMYK, which has oncogenic properties, and we've been able to demonstrate that you can reverse the epigenetic clock with no loss of cell identity and no tumor formation. So these are really important improvements over OSKM by just using OSK. Um, so a number of papers have already been published showing that epigenetics can drive mammalian aging and that these effects are reversible um, and that these epigenetic marks, including DNA methylation, are primary drivers of mammalian aging as, um, as a reversible, and that OSK can be used to rejuvenate cells, to reverse aging, and to repair injury. So where do you go first? So as Kelsey just mentioned before, eye is a great place to go, and our first indications are focused on optic neuropathies, both chronic and acute, which have retinal ganglion cell dysfunction. So we're, we're approaching primary open angle glaucoma, and as mentioned before, NION. Um, Glaucoma is a chronic progressive disease um, with 3 million folks having it in the U.S. It's a group of conditions that affect the optic nerve, characterized often by increased ocular pressure, and it's the only known modifiable risk factor at this time. It is the leading cause of blindness for people over age 60. And risk factors include aging, family history, race, use of systemic or topical corticosteroids, and high intraocular pressure. There are currently no lasting treatments for glaucoma, so even if you lower IOP, the disease continues to progress. And so disease management just involves IOP lowering medication, laser surgery, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, or ultimately a more uh, trabeculectomy. Nyon is another RGC dysfunction disorder, but in this case, it's a sudden painless loss of vision in one eye so literally people go to sleep at night, they wake up the next morning, and they have a loss of vision in one eye. Um, it's about two to, th two to 10 people per 100,000. Uh, the mechanism is a loss of blood flow to the optic nerve, which leads to the sudden vision loss. It's the most common acute optic neuropathy in patients over the age of 50. 
And again, risk factors include aging, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and importantly, previous evidence of NION in one eye. So if you have it in one eye, there's a reasonable chance that over the next five to 10 years, you might have a NION incident in the second eye. And there are no current treatments currently available. So we're gonna apply partial epigenetic reprogramming to retinal ganglion cells. So the goal here is to take a mature cell and convert it to a healthy younger cell, again, while maintaining cell identity. So we're gonna express OSK in cells, increase TED activity, look at, see changes in DNA methylation pattern back to a more youthful state, leading to retinal ganglion cell rejuvenation and then ultimately axon regrowth and vision restoration. To do this, we're using ER100, which is a controlled expression of OSK. It's a TET-on system where we're using two vectors, two AAV, two vectors. The first is under a CMV promoter to create an RTTA, and the second is under a TRE promoter, which is controlled so OSK does not express. Um, and then when you, the RTTA is formed and combines with systemic administration of doxycycline, what you can do is get it to bind to the promoter here and cause the expression of OSK. And so if you look over here, you can see in the retina, you can look when they, there's no doxycycline, you see RGC cells, but you don't see uh, expression of KLF4. And then when you administer doxycycline, you can see this co-expression of KLF4, indicating that with doxycycline, you can get OSK to its target and turn it on. So ER100 has been used to improve vision, visual function, and DNA methylation in a number of mouse models of aging, noptic nerve crush, and glaucoma. Mice are good, but even better would be if we could make this translation to non-human primates. So mice have low visual acuity, they have non-foveal vision, they have a distinct pattern of retinal aging, and they lack some of the same higher order visual processing, whereas non-human primates and humans have many of similar functions, and they also have an inner limiting membrane, which serves as a little bit of a barrier to transduction. So first thing that was done was we used a AAV2 and a GFP, gave an intravigial ejection just to look to see where could we get AAV2 to deliver to, and you can see that you get parafoveal expression and superior and inferior expression, suggesting that it was worthwhile to go ahead and test OSK. So let me just tell you briefly about this non arteriac uh, anterior ischemic model or nion model. So basically a laser is used to the optic nerve head that creates this damage. Uh, and basically what we're looking here is at a pattern electrogram. Again, this is the signal that's shifting back and forth, this checkerboard design. If we look at a human, the human nion condition, what you can see is in the control eye, you can see this very nice pattern. You get a peak, you get a valley, um, and a very nice curve. In nion, what you can see is you attenuate the peak, you attenuate the valley, and you can see that the slope gets changed. If we look in the laser-induced nion model in the non-human primates, now we can see, again, this characteristic signal. The top of the peak is a P50, the bottom is a 95. So we can look at the upward deflection to P50. We can look at the entire amplitude from P50 to N95. And then we can look at what happens after the laser treat damage, where you can see this attenuation of P50, attenuation of this N95 signal, and a change in the slope, suggesting that this is a highly translatable model from non-human primate to the nion condition. So we did a rescue study looking at the administration of ER100 one day post-laser. So we wanted to make sure that the damage has already started to occur, Remember, people with nion, they wake up the next morning, the damage is done. So we didn't want to start by treating ahead of time. We want to be able to treat after the damage begins. And then uh, we administer doxycycline for a period out to six weeks. Uh, we had an N of four in the vehicle-treated group, an N of six in the OSK-treated group. And in each animal, you have a control eye that has no treatment, and then the eye that either got laser in vehicle or laser and OSK. If we look at the top fi figure on the right, you can see the P50 amplitude. And what you can see is starting at week one and going out to five weeks, you can see that the damage, there's a decrease in P50 from the laser treatment. Um, and you can see a decrease in this uh, 
P P50 minus N95, indicating that the laser-induced damage was consistent with producing the model that we expected. ER100 reverses these pattern ERG deficits in the model. So again, if we look at P50 here, you can see there was no difference at baseline for the groups. And now what you can see, although not significant, you can even start to see at week three um, a, a big change in pattern ERG that becomes significant at weeks three and week five for the P50 amplitude. And for P50 minus N95, again, you can see a strong trend at week three, and then it becomes statistically significant at week five. So now what we've done is we've been able to demonstrate that we can go from mouse to human, we can take multiple methods of RGC dysfunction and demonstrate that we can reverse them. I wanna show you two individual animals just to highlight a little bit more about what the effects that we're seeing. So if we look at the vehicle animal over here, you can see baseline in blue. Actually, baseline in blue is on both. You can see it pretty consistently and reproducibly. And then look at vehicle at one week and five weeks post laser, and you can see there's this massive blunting of the pattern ERG signal. If we look in the tre treated monkey, what you can see here, if you look at the green line, you can see an attenuation here of the P50, but really you can see this whole curve is markedly affected. But the important thing is to look at week five. So five weeks post-treatment, and now what you can see is this P50 response is returning, but more importantly, the entire shape and nature of the curve has been restored, indicating an effect of OSK.